Barry. Yep. I'm not going to shake your hand. All right. That was awesome. I hadn't seen that app before, but now I really wish I'd been at that appathon the whole time. All right, come on up, Adam. So uh, I, was, I was reading Adam's book, Adam Lushinsky, uh, senior editor at large at Fortune. I don't know what that means. Come on, have a seat. Let me go over here. Um, I was reading Adam's book, and I was thinking to myself, so this book is all about Apple. I was thinking about all the things that are similar between Apple and AppNexus. So you know, we both took money from Vinrock. That's good. Um, we both start with app, so that's good. Um, we both took money from Microsoft at a critical time in our history. <laughs> and then I read this part where Steve Jobs puts a pirate flag on top of a building. And you know, I was like, wait, wait, wait. We are not into piracy. It's so not part of our core values. So I decided we were actually very different companies after all. So with that, Adam, I was wondering if you could tell us, uh, give us a quick synopsis of the book and save us all $27. <laughs> I would, I would highly encourage you to not save $27, obviously. Um, by the way, I hate it when people I interview begin by trying to butter me up, but I just want to say that that was, that was fantastic. It reminded me of a company that I've spent the last year of my life following, and you know, I'll never forget the day that Apple had the Stanford professor who plays classical music with his iPhone up on stage demonstrating the app that he had created to do that. I mean, because it was so obvious to everyone in the audience, if he can do that, who knows what else, what else we could do. And, and secondly, everyone assumes that you can only do that with a, with a consumer play, and you just showed it very nicely B2B, so sorry. Thank for, you very much. Yeah. Um, so uh, the, the premise of my book is that uh, everybody in the world thinks they understand Apple because they understand Apple's products and they love Apple's products. But in fact, the general business person, general person, knows absolutely nothing about Apple because that's how Apple wants it. Apple wants us to focus on their products. And yet, if it's the most successful company in the world, maybe we should pay attention to how they do the business of being Apple. And that's, that's the premise of my book. And the, the very high level learning is that they do business differently than just about every other business and differently from the way business is taught in business schools. And so I can, you know, I sort of go down the list and, and discuss that and say to the reader, if you're in the business world, if you're in a career, if you're an entrepreneur, I'm not saying you necessarily should do what Apple does, but you ought to understand what Apple does and consider doing what Apple does. It's great. And I, I read your book and thought, you know, the whole way through, here's innovation. Here's a company that continues to innovate, does things completely differently. And, you know, there's a few things that really stand out that are different. So the first obvious one is secrecy. So um, I like to say that every company has secrets. Uh, it, uh, the difference is that at Apple, everything is a secret. So every company knows you don't want your competitors knowing what you're doing, if possible. You don't, in the device world in particular, you don't want your customers knowing until you're ready to give it to them for the simple and obvious reason that they'll stop buying the one that's available if they know that a new one is coming. Um, but the, the, the fascinating thing about Apple is its internal secrecy. And this is definitely of the don't necessarily try this at home uh, variety. They keep secrets from each other. So if you and I work at, uh, both work at Apple, uh, we, and, and yet we're on different teams, your business is none of my business, and my business is none of your business. And this uh, permeates the culture of the company. And the, the, cult, the easiest cultural example of this is that one of the reasons the Google founders have always given for the free food is that they want people to come together in the cafeteria and talk to each other about what they're working on. There might be some serendipitous learnings, at Apple, number one, there's no free food. And number two, they do not want people coming together in the cafeteria and talking because that might mean divulging secrets, disclosing things, and they have a language around disclosure that are not supposed to be disclosed. That's a great point. And if you come to our new AppNexus office, uh, we just moved in on Friday. I haven't been there yet. You'll note that almost every employee can see almost every other employee. So that's obviously a no-no at Apple. Except they just built this big, wide open office space. Well, they're, they're, it's, a, it's an interesting observation. They are building a, a brand new headquarters. It won't, be, it won't be ready for, I think, at least three years. And yes, it's one of the features is a, a lots of coll collaborative space. There's, um, the, I, I describe Apple as a company of paradoxes, and Steve Jobs was a paradoxical person. You know, he, he lived relatively humbly for a multi billionaire. There, he parked his car and he walked around 
the neighborhood. He didn't have a security gate. And yet we learned from Walter Isaacson's book that he was building a mega yacht toward the end of his life. And Apple has never had a fancy headquarters. For people are sort of shocked even today at the way that they spread out over Cupertino. And it, there's nothing particularly impressive about it, which is, you know, everyone knows about this danger of what happens to companies when they get an edifice complex and start building a brand new headquarters. And that's exactly what they're doing. It's weird. Yeah, well, I think we should all aspire to be relatively modest billionaires. Can we all agree to that? Um, <laughs> I think so. So the other thing I think is, is amazing is their just obsession throughout the book and with, with perfection. Um, a summit like this would have been rehearsed countless times and would be, you know, everything would be completely scripted, uh, which is interesting because you see that in their products. And I'm curious if you think that just, is that cultural? Is that something that's all jobs? How much of that survives through to this new regime? Well, you know, the answer is sort of yes, yes, and yes. It was, it's jobs, and so it was cultural. And because he imprinted, he defined the culture. And then I think it's, and I, I think it largely does survive. I think the culture will survive. As a matter of fact, I think if they fail, they'll fail because they adhered, they failed the right way, if you will. In other words, they're not going to all of a sudden start revenue optimizing rather than doing, do, focusing on design and having design be paramount. I think if they fail, it'll be because the design isn't good, not because they demoted design. And you know the rehearsing is is fascinating. There, I, I, there are all these stories about before something like this, uh, someone presenting, like your partners who just presented, first would come present for junior executives in Cupertino, then more senior executives, and then more senior executives, and then ultimately a day or two before the event for Steve Jobs, who might kill the demo if he didn't if he didn't like the way his partner did the demo or didn't like something about it. That's amazing. Well, that was the first time I saw that, so. It's You're late. not there yet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's just amazing because I think about this a lot in context of, of startups. We've got a lot of emerging companies here. Almost everyone in this audience is either a CEO or a senior executive at a company that's really aspiring to be great. Mm -hmm. And so one reason I was hoping you'd come is because it was great to hear you talk about Apple, but I want to apply that to these guys. So what do you think the lessons are? We, we can't all be quite that secretive, but no. what do these guys need to do to really build their businesses like Apple? Nor, nor do you necessarily want to be just like Apple or, or, very importantly, just like Steve Jobs. I mean, in all seriousness, there's, there is no one else like him. But uh, and th this is a topic among, of discussion among Apple people. Do, do, you, do you really need to be such a difficult person? And I'm in front of a big group. I'm purposely using the word difficult euphemistically. Um, but what can you do? You know, his advice to entrepreneurs, and he loved entrepreneurs. He loved to meet with them and talk to them. And yeah, there was this sneaking suspicion maybe he was going to steal their ideas. But especially later in life, he really just wanted to be around entrepreneurs. And his advice was, um, what you can learn from Apple is to do what you're best at obsessively to the exclusion of everything else. Be honest about what you're really good at and do that. And don't do all those other things, because you're probably not going to be good at them. This is something Apple's very good at, even as a really big company, where you can criticize Apple around the edges. They, they've, as they've grown, inevitably, they start doing things that they're not terribly good at. So entrepreneurs can ruthlessly screen out the things that they're not good at, both as people and as companies. And then the other thing that a company of any size can emulate Apple on, I think, is to be really clear about its message. First of all, internally, who are we? What do we stand for? And then even more importantly, as you've already said, externally, how are we going to communicate it? Who is allowed to speak for this company? What are the words that they're going to use in public? These are things that, a, that the 50,000 plus person Apple thinks about. So it seems to me an obvious thing that a, um, that a, that a small startup would also want to think about. One last thing. Giant company, for years it has a, a, an expression, the DRI, the Directly Responsible Individual. This, this lingo, by the way, predates 1997 when Steve Jobs came back to the company. The DRI at Apple is exactly what it sounds like. It's the person who's responsible for somebody, for, excuse me, for something, for a task. My assumption in my experience covering business and working for a company as I do is that most companies are really bad at this. They don't know who's responsible, or there's three people who are responsible for something. You want to be like Apple? Then define the task and define who's responsible for it.
That's great. And Apple also holds people accountable. So the directly responsible individual, as I understand it, if they don't deliver, they're very likely to be fired or pushed off to some kind of Apple Siberia. Um, more the, no, you're right, more, more the latter. It's actually, it, yeah. My understanding is it's not a real firing culture, but yeah, the marginalized. Marginalized, yeah. The other thing I thought was cool is that, you know, not cool per se, but you, you, were, you said in the book that you, know, you can tell which Apple products you know, were really important and not. Um, for instance, my headphones, which I swear I've broken like 16 sets of my iPhone headphones, obviously not something they care a whole lot about, um, although they've gotten whatever $30 times 16 is, so it's actually brilliant. They've gotten almost as much from my headphones as from my iPhone. <laughs> yeah. you know, so we'll work on that. But they haven't had to put the really high quality, really high quality research into it. Yeah, and so the, the culture of Apple is that, and, and this is, was very much a Steve thing. If Steve was interested, because he thought it was critical to where Apple was right this minute or for the next two, three years, then this product would get tons of love and even more so if he used it. And so for example, we know that he was a Keynote user. He loved Keynote. The Keynote began as a, 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 proje a project for him to do his Keynotes and then they realized it was pretty good so they offered it to the public. Um, Steve Jobs did not care about spreadsheets. <laughs> And so, you know, you're never going to hear anybody singing the praises of numbers, which for people who don't know is an actual name of a spreadsheet program that Apple has because Jobs didn't use numbers. That's awesome. Yeah, I bet many of us are guilty of the same thing, that inside our companies we see that the things we care about get a lot of attention and others don't, but I suspect we're not nearly as precise and thoughtful about how to focus as Jobs was. Well, I just want to say it became um, a virtue for Apple, but and I, I discussed this in the book, you could just as easily make the philosophical case that it was, uh, that it was a bad thing, right? So things would, um, things would flounder and he, because he wasn't paying attention and they just, you know, they would just sort of, they, did, they, would, they would lack for attention and so the features wouldn't develop and, and whatnot. Um, that, is, that worked out okay for the company that made the iPod, the iPhone and the iPad and, and the MacBook Air, right? But um, one of the things I speculate on is that Apple people will refer to, referred to the Steve Jobs bottleneck. The bottleneck not only was that he wouldn't show love to things he wasn't interested in, but because he couldn't show love to too many things at once, anything that wasn't right in front of him didn't get, didn't move forward. And I, you know, I speculate that they may become a little more professionalized now and focus on more things. That's an interesting point. So in terms of, Tim Cook as the CEO. So, you know, we have this incredible culture. It's now really been, you mentioned they hired uh, business school professors to come work at Apple, that Steve started thinking about his legacy even before he left and said, I want to make sure this culture survives me. And now we have a new CEO who you, you discuss a couple times as being, you know, I forget you say the word, not interim exactly. A caretaker is the a word. A caretaker, right. Yeah. So what does that mean? Well, it's, you know, it's obviously one of the two or three most important topics regarding Apple's future. It's, it's a leadership question. How do you replace somebody who's irreplaceable? And so I, I think that Cook, Tim Cook, the current CEO, first of all, first of all, he's totally different from Steve Jobs in every single way. And I think this is what made him palatable to Steve Jobs as a successor. Steve Jobs chose him. And I don't think he could have chosen somebody who was like him a little bit. Um, but I think he's also a culture keeper. He loves, he loves Apple. He really believes in Apple. People believe that he believes in Apple. And so um, I, I think he'll be a perfectly fine CEO. The, the question that I, no one can answer authoritatively is, you know, who's going to make the decision to kill a multi-billion dollar project because it just doesn't feel right? I don't think it's going to be Tim Cook. And to, to put a, you know, a more positive veneer on that, you know, who's going to make the go decision on something that really requires this, you know, I'm I, I need to find a nicer way to say this, but Jobs had an almost idiot savant ability to say this, this is it. Uh, most businesses can't do that. That's why most businesses uh, operate with a portfolio theory approach to product and Apple doesn't. Yeah, that's a great point. And I, I saw an article in the journal a few days ago talking about how you know Silicon Valley CEOs are starting to uh, try to imitate Jobs, and you know I was thinking about that and thinking if I should instead of my tux wear a black turtleneck, <laughs> decided that would be too obvious. Um, so, quest for you is you know you mentioned before we shouldn't all try to be like Steve Jobs, but if you could really hone it down for us, what are the two or three things that we really should and shouldn't do 
to make our companies at least get the good parts of Apple, but perhaps without the bad. You mean particular as, as, CEOs, as leaders? leaders. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm, I, I'm pausing because what I'm about to say, Sal, I, I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative of the fact that what I'm going to suggest is really hard. Okay, but what Jobs, what, what Apple is particularly good at is to, to this day, you ask anyone at Apple why they like working at Apple, and they will bring up some version of the fact that they understand the mission of the company. They understand what the company is about. That's not by mistake. It's because Jobs told them what the company was about. He told them in words, he told them in deeds, he told them in punishment, you know, he told them when he was dissatisfied because you're not doing what the company is about. So you don't need to be about what Apple's about. And so one example, it's extraordinary. I love it because I think it's so compelling from a narrative perspective, but he was not particularly interested in money. Uh, you know, he, he had this weird relationship with money. We already talked about that, but it's germane because that's how Apple behaves. This is one of these things people tell you and then you don't believe it until you hear it 17 times. They won't have revenue discussions early on in the, in the lifespan of a, of a product. Like, no, don't bother me with a revenue discussion because that's not what this is about. I love that. But not everyone can do that. The fact is, if you're an Apple employee, you understand. It's almost like this old blue blood thing, don't talk about money. It's true, you don't talk about money. So, but people understand these things. So I think leaders at companies need to make sure that, that the people in the company understand what the company's about. Makes a lot of sense. Which means, by the way, the company has to be about something. Well, that's a minor detail. Um, <laughs> I appreciate that. And as many of you know, AppNexus has always had a hard time about being about one thing. So I'm, I'm getting some good lessons here. Um, let me open this up to the audience. I know almost everyone here is as obsessed with Apple as I am. So come on up, ask questions. You know, Adam's been thinking about Apple forever. Carl. Hi, good morning, or good afternoon. It's morning somewhere. I was just talking to somebody in the audience as you were talking about this. How would you compare Steve Jobs to Jack Welch? I mean, let's think about this. If you go back in time, Jack Welch was, everybody's looking at this guy. Oh my God, he's unbelievable. Yeah. And he was a hell of a leader. And so was Steve. I'm just kind of curious if you've ever thought about that. Oh, sure, I've thought about it, and I, I can't go into any detail, but I've discussed it with Jack Welch. Um, <laughs> I mean, I can't go into any detail about what, what he said to me, but um, because he's very interested in this topic, super interested. And, you know, it, it's, it, he's a really interesting guy, and he's had the great good fortune of living a lot longer than, than Steve Jobs did. Um, and I was fascinated by this article in the Wall Street Journal about two months ago that's, that uh, talked about General Electric de-emphasizing its very famous Jack Welchian concept of moving its senior people around uh, the company to expose them to different things. So I cover this in, in the book. This is antithetical to the, to the Apple way. The Apple way is, if you're really good at something, why in the world, to broaden your horizons, would I move you to do something that you're not good at or to, to expose you to a different industry? How, explain to me exactly how that's good for shareholders so, or to the product. So Jobs had an opinion on this. Um, and I, I, I'm very clear. I do not think that every company can be structured like Apple. The easiest thing is, can you have a giant company with three or four important products? If the answer is no, and most companies will be honest, the answer is no, then you can't do that the way Apple does. But I do think Apple provides a model, and not many big companies follow it. Almost no big companies follow it. Other questions out there? All right, so I'll throw one out there. So we look at Apple and we look at Google. You mentioned this before. And, and one place this really shows in the product landscape is the iPhone and Android. Mm -hmm. You know, which in some ways embody, I think, both of those companies yeah, very well. I agree. So do you see other places where we can look at those two and, and see where they go and what that means? And for all of us, as we start pondering mobile as an advertising industry, um, there are two different philosophies for us. In the Apple case, we have a very closed, protected environment. And guess what? That's how they approach advertising. And I think for Google, it's yeah. likely to be a much more open, um, but less standardized, less controlled environment. So um, in, in a lot of senses, it's an, the comparisons are unfair and that Apple very neatly uh, encapsulates the device world and Google very neatly illustrates the internet world. And so 
it, it, at one level, it makes sense that Apple would be closed and Google would be open because e even their technologies are, are follow the follow the pattern. Um, but in another sense, it's going to be a really interesting time going forward because um, Apple's, you know, for all of its great successes, is not really very good on the internet. It's not been their strength. They don't under they clearly don't understand social, for example. And they're not really um, an advertising company. They're great advertisers, by the way, and uh, wonderfully old school, right? They believe in, in television and print, which you know I'm really grateful <laughs> for them for believing in it. But uh, they're 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 babies in the uh, in, you know as a, as an advertise as an advertising platform. And the same is true for Google on devices. They're they're complete neophytes on on devices, no one really even seems to believe that they want to be in the device business, never mind the fact that they're spending $13 billion to acquire one. So um, it, it's going to be, th their enmity, I think, is going to be interesting for, for all of you to, to watch and hope that you're not collateral damage and instead that you can benefit from it. Let's all hope so. I like that. All right. So Adam, thank you so much. This has been lovely. My pleasure. Thank you. Very good job. Thank you. So Adam Lashinsky from Fortune. Uh, Adam will be outside signing his books uh, when we're done. One hint, don't let him sign your Kindle. I made that mistake, had to get a brand new Kindle. All right? So as we wrap up, I want to think back on this day. We've really done one thing, which is innovation. Um, we've talked about video, a big announcement. We talked about the App Nexus Accelerate program and the venture partners we have. We've seen how major market-leading companies are building apps around the ecosystem. And you're seeing how AppNexus employees are leveraging the system to build apps themselves and continue our long history of innovation. And then we compared ourselves to Apple. Um, <laughs> pretty much the day in a nutshell. So you know, it really goes back. I was thinking, this is our fifth summit. If, uh, if any, of your, any of you were here three years ago at our first San Francisco summit, it was about this big and um, it was very disorganized, um, but the content was great. And uh, you know, I was thinking through all of these summits as they get more professional and they get bigger. Um, and there's really four themes that keep coming through our summits. And I really think they encompass the essence of AppNexus. Platform, quality, people, and innovation. I might, might be one more than Steve Jobs would have had, but I really do think that's the core of what we do and what we're about. And I really want to thank all of you for being part of this. It's really a pleasure to build and innovate and create this ecosystem with you. Now, before we go, let me remind you that we do have another summit coming up in November. Um, we're going to change the format just a little bit, and uh, along with having some of our first AppNexus Accelerate uh, partners doing demos on stage, we're going to play with some new ideas. So, Watch your inboxes. We're going to come back to you in a couple weeks with some new ideas for format to get everyone more involved up here on stage. And with that, thank you so much. We've got lunch outside. See you in November. <laughs>